Good evening all. Uh, unfortunately, the job interview mentioned in last week's video didn't go nearly as well as I'd hoped, so my current state of unemployment remains unchanged. Hooray! I say hooray very sarcastically, but in the words of the great philosopher Gypsy. Ah, uh, but such are the vicissitudes of sport! Mm, indeed. And for this week's video, we're going to pick up our Lola story, since last week we did Bentley and Huntingdon is but a couple of hours away from crew. So, a nice drive along the A14 and a jump of 30-odd years seemed worthwhile, although now featuring far more speed cameras on the A14 than they had back in the 30s or 60s. Anyway, this week we're looking at the successor to the Lola T70, the very logically named T160. Honestly, even after reading a couple bits that ostensibly explain the Lola naming conventions, they still strike me as, well, somewhat idiosyncratic, to put it politely and to put it accurately, about as logical as the electric systems in my 928. I suppose they couldn't call it a T71 because there was already a Cooper open-wheel car and Luxembourgish basketball team that go by that name, and the commies had already seized the means of production when it came to calling things T72, so what the heck? 1 plus 6 is 7, so let's call it the 160 since it's an iterative improvement over the T70 or something? Logic. Anyway, the T160 came about as a crash program replacement and successor to the extremely popular T70. Uh, the T70's final years in competition saw it struggle against newer vehicles, despite clinching the first Can-Am championship in 1966 under the helmsmanship of John Surtees. However, McLaren came to dominate Can-Am in subsequent years with the M6A and M8A, which, incidentally, if anyone has one of those kicking about that they'd like to let me photograph for doing a video on, please do reach out. Alternating championships between Mr. Bruce McLaren himself and Denny Hulne in what came to be jocularly referred to as the Bruce and Denny Show era of the series. As between 1967 and 1970, a mere two races out of 32 total saw a victory go to non-McLarens, one to a T70 in 1967 and one to a Porsche in 1970. The success of the 1970 season was, of course, dampened somewhat by Mr. McLaren's unfortunate death while testing the new M8D less than two weeks before the season opener, but with all due respect, and in all honesty, quite a bit of due respect to the honored dead, this video is about the Lola, so let's pivot back to that now. The T160 was essentially an evolution of the T70 to take advantage of updates to the Group 7 rules, with enough changes to justify the design of an entirely new chassis and bodywork, and consequently bringing a new model number. Mr. Eric Broadley joins us again as chief designer, with the aluminum monocoque subtly widened to accommodate new big block engines from Chevy and Ford, fulfilling the need for increased power over the T70, while the suspension received adjustments to allow the running of fatter tires. However, despite these changes, the essence of the vehicle remained the same. As mentioned, an aluminum monocoque chassis, or aluminium for our friends in uh, the birthplace of the car, with fiberglass body panels. Engines were typically sourced from Chevy, although a minority of cars ran Ford engines, and the most common power plant for the T160 series, series because uh, iterative improvements resulted in the 162, 163, and 165 in later years, more on that in a moment, was a 7-liter V8 motor producing north of 625 horsepower, up from 550 to 600 in the later Chevy-powered T70s. It also gave the car this delightfully Susian set of throttle bodies and air intakes. I think that's what those are. The Hewland 5-speed manual was the same, however, uh, the LG 600, and power still went to the rear wheels. Suspension in the front remained double wishbones with coilovers and dampers, but the rear lost its upper wishbone for toplings and trailing arms in the interests of the aforementioned changes to fit more rear rubber. Gearling ventilated disc brakes still provided stopping power, and weight increased slightly from the late T70 Spiders, likely due to the larger engine, to 670 kilograms or 1,477 pounds. Ready for the start of the 1968 Can-Am season, three cars were entered in the competition and, well, they performed not great, really, despite having Dan Gurney and Sam Posey as two of the leading drivers. They really just weren't up to the task against the McLarens, which had had a longer development cycle, 
And indeed, the only non-McLaren in the top six in the championship was the ever-competitive Jim Hall with his latest Chaparral, the 2G. T70 Mark III B actually outplaced all of the new 160s and came seventh overall in the, in the championship, driven by George Fulmer. Although they had better results, including a couple of wins in the U.S. Road Racing Championship that year, which is the series in which it actually made its debut, that series folded after the 1968 edition, so Can-Am remained the primary focus. The interseason period brought improvements in the form of the T162 and subsequently T163, lowering the ride height to greatly aid handling and aerodynamics, with the T163 instantly recognizable due to its extremely tall rear wing, which was the whole thing in race car design at the time, not just in Can-Am, and I probably need to do a video to talk about the whole tall wing phenomenon separately. That notwithstanding, 1969 also saw a greatly expanded Can-Am roster and schedule, due in no small part to the death of the US RRC, and while the Bruce and Denny show achieved the highest Nielsen ratings ever for a race program, which is to say the two of them won every one of the races in the season, uh, six for Mr. McLaren and five for Mr. Hulme, uh, Chuck Parsons T163 held off strong competition from other racing luminaries, such as Joe Siffert in a Porsche 917 PA, Chris Amon, who looks remarkably amusingly similar to Richard Hammond in a Ferrari 612P, uh, Surtees, now driving a Chaparral, uh, Dan Yarney back in a McLaren, and a bevy of other great names to take best of the rest in the championship, including a second-place finish at Riverside and three-thirds behind the two McLarens of Hulme and McLaren. The end of the season also saw the banning of the big wings in the series and necessitated the final evolution of the T160, dubbed the T165, and the variant that's been depicted in most of the photos used for this video. Anyway, this revision, while another significant improvement to the car, remained insufficient to stand up to McLaren's might, and this year the best result for a Lola went to Dave Causey, whose de-winged T163 came fourth overall behind, you guessed it, three McLarens. 1971 saw the introduction of a new T220, but by that time, Porsche's star was rising with the iterations of the 917, which would eventually produce more than 1,100 horsepower and, like the high wing, prove so decisively successful that they dominated themselves into obsolescence. In total, around 25 T160 series cars were built, with a number of earlier cars upgraded to T165 spec, and while ultimately the T160 series never managed to make quite the mark that it could have under really any set of different circumstances, it was nevertheless a popular vehicle amongst its drivers, and some continue to be raced to this day. In an interesting side trip to the world of road cars, the T165 also provided the base for a somewhat abortive attempt to make a Can-Am slash Group 6 car for the road in the early 80s, when brothers and air I believe airline pilots, possibly airline engineers, Charlie and Don Bartz converted a T70 for their own road use and then decided to market the idea, modifying a T165 chassis with T70-esque bodywork and road car comforts, such as air conditioning, a synchronized gearbox, and even a stereo. Offered for a rather high-watering $102,500 in 1984, it did offer 560 horsepower and 465 pound-feet of torque in a vehicle that weighed less than a ton, so performance, to be fair, would have been similarly eye-watering. Uh, for reference against contemporaneous road vehicle offerings, the Ferrari 288 GTO retailed new in the same year for 83,400 US and made about 400 horsepower, while the Lamborghini Countach uh, LP500 was around 450 horsepower and $100,000. But nonetheless, the T165-70, as it was called, didn't really seem to have actually sold well well, if at all. Kind of like I expect the Van Wall road variant of their hypercar to do, and maybe the Glickenhaus LMH007. I think that's got a slightly better chance of selling something, but be that as it may. Anyway, that brings us to the end of another video. Thank you for watching, and for this week's call to action not featuring the three sacred words of YouTube, like, comment, subscribe.
Remember to stay hydrated, use your turn signals, and if you haven't recently done so, it's probably time to check the air filters in your car and home. With that said, once again, thank you for your time this evening, or whenever and wherever you are watching, and I wish you all a good night and a good tomorrow.